The following is intended for mature audiences only. Discretion is advised. What's up, besties? Welcome back to another episode of Child Like It Best with Mike Valdez. I am still the second part of that title. If you're listening to this on release day, I am going to be at Florida Supercon this July 4th weekend from Thursday until Sunday doing some stand-up for Lisa Correo's Revenge of the Nerds comedy show. I'm not sure about the times just yet, but you can make sure to be on my Instagram at Mike Valdez or my Twitter. I am Mike Valdez. I will make sure that you get all the dates and the times. Come hang out, man. This is going to be really fun. It's going to be a lot of laughs. It's going to be a lot of cool nerdy stuff. We're going to have a blasty blast. This episode is Luis Diaz. He's a stand-up comedian, radio DJ, and personality from the morning show at Power 96, 96.5 in Miami, Miami's hottest radio station. This guy is super funny. I've known him for a couple of years now, and I'm honored that I got to talk to him. This guy's a really great friend, and I'm very grateful to consider him that. So please enjoy my friend, Luis Diaz. shot a video for uh, croquetas and cafecito yesterday. Yeah. What was that about? So, are we starting? I mean, technically. I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, man, because you obviously have Instagram. But... Yeah, yeah. So, it just upsets me that the punchline to every joke yeah. on every meme page that is, oh, we're the ultimate Miami meme page. Oh, I don't know right. if I'm allowed to say them on the podcast. Yeah. But let's let's call them only in Miami. <laughs> Lifestyle Dade. Yeah. You know, all those pages. The punchline to every joke, it either involves croqueta right. or cafecito. That's true. Oh, when, when there's no espumita on your cafecito <laughs> and it's a, a bomb. Or the first time you had cafecito versus the 7,000th time you had cafecito, and it's both the same excited. Like, dude, <laughs> the punchline to every joke can't just be croquetas and cafecito. Yeah. And so, like, I just, I got tired of it, and I wrote a song about it. <laughs> That's funny. And so I was like, in today's day, you can't just write a song. You have to make a music video, so I made a music video for it. Too. Yeah. That's funny. And you've the, you've also had, like, other things like you've done other songs right yeah, yeah, yeah having a job at a radio station there's not much you can do yeah when it doesn't come to, when it comes to not musically yeah so i try to do as much as i can get as funny as i can involving music so that way you know the radio station backs it up because if i like they're not going to post a regular stand-up set of mine that's true but they'll post something that involves music so yeah. that's where the parody songs come in that's where the Jon Snow saying Old Town Road comes in. Yeah, that like, was so freaking good. It's stupid. It's That's stupid stuff. Of, <laughs> it's something that I didn't realize how accurate it looked <laughs> until you did it. And then I was like, oh my gosh, this is legit. <laughs> can I can I tell you the, the blue jacket? Yeah. Because like if you watch Game of Thrones, you know he's got the dark black, gray, brown fur yeah. jacket. So I'm like, I'm going to go to Burlington Coat Factory, find a fur jacket, because they're the <laughs> coat factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to have a man's fur jacket. Of course. They had no fur in the men's section. <laughs> oh and the gosh. only fur they had was in the female section, petite, and it was that light blue jacket. And I was like, well, fuck it. He's yeah. going to be he's gonna be a little gay J. <laughs> Jon Snow. It's Pride Month. We can do this. That's amazing. I love it. Yeah, and what I was thinking was since since you have multiple songs, if you ever come out with an album, I think the album name should be called Pure de Papi. <laughs> <laughs> Pure de Papi. <laughs> yeah. Can I tell you, that's fucking awesome. Yeah, and you can be Papi Churro, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, no, no. I already, have my, I already have my rap name. What is your rap name? I have one that I go by on the radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is Most Alone. That's way better. And I, but then I also like my daughter's name is Mackenzie. We call her Mac. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can also go by by Mac the Daddy. Mac Daddy. <laughs> That's a big, I love it. <laughs> I love it. So it's I and, and but damn, Papi Churro. Yeah. Because I, 
I love those. Who doesn't love churros? They're great. <laughs> and I love all the iterations, the donut sticks, everything yeah. that resembles a churro. I love them. <laughs> well, as you know, we started. So, hey, everybody, this is Child Like It Best with Mike Valdez. Hey, guys, guess what? I'm Mike Valdez. And today I have a great guest with me, stand-up comedian, radio DJ, Papi Churro himself, <laughs> Luis Diaz. How you doing, Luis? Oh, man. <laughs> I almost spit out my water. <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we like to do here, man. So I'm hydrated for sure. Yeah, for sure. That's how I'm doing. Hydrated. So the first thing that I, I want to do before we start is I we here at Child Like It Best, we like to take a Flintstones vitamin before I ask the first question. So if you'd like, those are the Flintstone Complete Gummies. But they're gummies, right? Yeah, they are gummies. Okay, good. Yeah, they're not the chalk ones. Oh, I hate those. Those are the worst. <laughs> trying to i can balance the microphone on my stomach yeah <laughs> bro can i tell you when i was a kid yeah i forgot that these were vitamins uh-huh and i ate half a bottle oh of flintstone gosh. gummies what happened i was so fucking healthy yeah. <laughs> my doctor was like so you are in peak physical fitness i lost 18 18 pounds <laughs> yeah from i was in an hour <laughs> i lost 18 in an hour that's great. Just one or two or five? However many you want. I can have half matter. a bottle. You can have half a bottle. Bro, it's crazy. My mom got super pissed. <laughs> so as you're taking that, tell me about where you grew up. Grew up down here in Miami, South Florida, uh, but like way out in Kendall. Yeah. Like I didn't know that alligators aren't a normal occurrence in most neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> or used as weapons. Bro, I've seen, I've seen so many alligators, iguanas in my life. And then I talked to, like, my brother-in-law. He's from Oregon. He's like, oh, when I come down to Miami, all I want to see is an alligator. I'm like, bitch, open your eyes. Yeah, like, they're everywhere. True. They're and everywhere. then I come up to, like, inland. Mm -hmm. So I'm in, like, Doral and shit. It's like, oh, there's no, there's no alligators here. What kind of <laughs> shit is this? But <laughs> I grew great. up, yeah, it's a, so very, very Hispanic Latinx community, yeah. I would say. The, the second generations in Miami yeah. were who I was surrounded by. Did you go to public or private school? Public, man. Okay. that's No, that's good. I'm a private school baby. So. Fuck you. <laughs> that's your way to brag. No, Show off to your guests. Actually, it's not at all. Hey, broke <laughs> bitches. Worse. How was your public school? <laughs> I think it's worse because, like, whatever, whatever I gained in, like, quote unquote education like i unlearned in in street knowledge <laughs> <laughs> so like hey you know, man we're, we're gonna buy a dime how much why would you buy a dime go to the bank you, yeah go to they the, have a lot of those i there. have a roll of dimes in my pocket <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well i went to public school because both of my parents are public school teachers oh great yeah yeah, yeah which is pretty awesome. much the story of everyone in kendall <laughs> fair enough <laughs> If you meet someone from Kendall, you, you don't have to ask what their parents did. They, they, their parents were one of them was a teacher. Yeah, the other one sells real estate. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> guaranteed. <laughs> so who would you say that you hung out with the most? Who were the kind of kids that you'd hang out with at the lunch table? It depends what what school, what grade. Oh so, man! So let's let's just go from like elementary first. So elementary school, I was actually a cool kid. Yeah, I was a here. cool kid, so I, I hung out with the cool kids. Uh, you know, pranking each other, putting putting sugar or salt in the orange juice, and yeah. <laughs> fucking with people's chocolate milk, putting <laughs> orange juice the in the cup, chocolate kid. milk. <laughs> 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 Why is he poke himself every day? <laughs> what a loser! No, so I was a pretty cool kid in in elementary school, and I went to middle school, and I went to a uh, not the feeder pattern. Yeah, I did. I went to a, a whole other school, so I didn't know anyone, and. <laughs> I had those middle school years that we don't like. I, I honestly don't remember middle school. I only remember like a few things, but I, I rarely remember middle school. I really only remember elementary and high school for sure. Because in, as you can tell, in, if you've watched like 13 reasons why or Riverdale <laughs> or any of those shows, everything in high school matters so much. <laughs> <laughs> can I tell you, you know, in elementary school, we would say, man, our, our school is probably what inspires Degrassi. Doubt it. We must, <laughs> we have the most drama than any elementary school. And then I go to middle school and I find out, oh, you guys touched each other's junk outside the pants too? <laughs> oh, that's, that's weird. <laughs> no, but like, I, so here's the thing with middle school. I was, I was not cool at all, man. Sure. I was a theater geek. 
Yeah. I, I was the nerd from the morning this announcements. Is, oh, I love it. And this it's crazy because my, my wife and I met while we were in middle school. We're middle school sweethearts. That's awesome. She would never have gone near me in middle school. Yeah. But thanks to me cooling up in high school and in college, she gave me the time of day. But no, you ask her, hey, how was Lewis in middle school? She doesn't like to answer either because she oh has she realized she's married to the guy. That's so funny. It's not for her. It's great for me. <laughs> what made you cool enough for your wife to be like, man, this actually seems like a legit dude now. <laughs> Can I tell you? We were working. I had a part time job after I left college. After I excuse me, after I got out of high school, I had a part time job as an after school care counselor. OK. All right. I was there for a year. For some reason, after my first year there, everyone left except for me and some other dude. Yeah. And so they had to hire a whole bunch of new people. And so I was kind of like the person in charge because the other guy was a pothead oh, and gosh. everyone knew it. So I was like the, the head person in charge. The whole new wave of after school care girls come in. Uh, counselors, not students. Yeah. I should say counselors. <laughs> she, and she's one of them. Okay. And so I'm like... Big dick in charge, and I go, hey, if you uh, if you need anything, you know, I kind of the guy who runs here. She's like, <laughs> and knowing damn well who she is, and she's like, Lewis, didn't we go to middle school together? I'm like, oh, did we? I don't know. <laughs> hey, did you, Laura? I think it is. Oh, fuck, bro. I don't even. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it's like, uh, it, the, have you ever had those moments where you're at? you know, Tijuana flats or something. And then someone's like, I recognize you. And you're like, yeah, I'm an actor. And they're like, no, we went to middle school together. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me once. And I was like, you know what? I'm never going to say I'm an actor ever again. <laughs> That's the fucking bro. It happened to me on Wednesday. That's so funny. Wednesday night. Cause I, I've gone on to do pretty cool things. I'm on radio. I'm on, st I'm, I'm doing stand up. I've yeah. been on TV uh, nothing big, obviously, yeah. but like, I've, I've done a couple cool things that my resume doesn't look that bad and I'm on stage and this girl goes, holy shit, I know you before I can say a word. Great show, start to a show. And I'm like, we did the show together. I remember the show. You were there on Wednesday. I was there on Wednesday. Some girl goes, holy shit. I know you. Yeah. And that ruined, not, not ruined, but I was, I, uh, we joked around and stuff. And then after the show, I went up to her and I was like, so what, do you listen to Power 96? Do you, have you been to here before and seen me perform before? And she goes, no, you went to Ferguson, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I fucking did. Yeah, but even so then, good. I was on TV at Ferguson. I was part of the morning announcements there, too. So it's like, ah, you know me from TV. So I'll take it. You know me, That's what I'll tell you people. You know me from TV? <laughs> Ferguson TV. Oh, my gosh. So you were, you were a theater kid and stuff. What kind of stuff did you did you do? Did you have like productions in, in school? Bro, of course. Yeah, were you of the course. lead? Of course. I it's very it was a little unfair. I, I think I was pretty good at acting. I still love acting. But it was a little unfair, you said? Because <laughs> because there are only two actors, male actors. Yeah. In my middle school. Let's I'll start from there. In my middle school, there's only two male actors, me and another dude. Yeah. This dude, by the way, has gone on to be in Thirteen Reasons Why. He's Done other things. Yeah. And a guy the, the year before us was on Glee. Mm -hmm. He's just made a movie now. I think it was, it was his third movie he's made. And I'm still here doing <laughs> more radio, sure. the lowest form of entertainment. Yeah. The same thing happened to me, actually, in high school. The guy that would get all the leads, which he was great. Don't get me wrong. But he was on a Nickelodeon show called The Brothers Garcia. It was the first, like, Latin Latinx show on Nickelodeon or on Teen Nick. And so everyone was like, well, he's obviously the best actor because he's the only one that's making money at it. So he should be the lead in everything. So I totally know how you feel. <laughs> but the problem is I was getting the leads too. Yeah. So like in eighth grade, our theater teacher said, all right, our two, not to talk shit, our two most talented people are these two men. Sure. Well, boys at the time. Yeah. So we did like The Odd Couple, which is a pretty much a two-man show. Yeah, of course. And... So it's crazy how we all had the same amount of potential, yeah. and they actually worked for it. That's <laughs> and they really got funny. It. It's like, oh, shit, that doesn't hurt. Do you have like any funny stories or embarrassing stories from being in theater or doing stuff on stage? Embarrassing stories? I, I'm such a talented and good actor. I, <laughs> I never really fucked anything up. That's funny. 
I just, I'm so good at what I do. Yeah. But I, I, rem- I do have one story where we were in rehearsal and I always hated rehearsing. Yeah. It's like, bro, learn your lines, be good at what you do and you'll be fine. Yeah. Apparently other people need, uh, what's, need practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, guys, just be naturally gifted like I am. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they couldn't, so we needed a practice. And we were practicing this scene where it was a, we were, at, at first glance, we look like Latin gangsters. Okay. And it turns out, like, in the beginning of the scene, we're two pairs, uh, me and a girl, and then another guy and another girl, are, are two pairs auditioning for West Side Story. Okay. It's a very funny scene. It's a comedy scene. And especially comedy to me, it's like, just improv your lines. We'll get from A to B, and we'll be fine. Exactly. And there was a part where we get into a little bit of a shoving match. Mm-hmm. And I'm a really big man. At the, at the time, I probably weighed 240. Okay. And the other guy that was pushing me weighed less than 100 pounds soaking wet. And I'm telling him, bro, for this scene to be believable, this is the part where we're actually mad at each other. You need to push me. I can take it. You, I will make it look real, but you need to push me because no one believes that you're mad at me. Yeah, for sure. So he gives me a little bit, and I'm like, fuck, man. This is not encouraging. So I push him hard. And his shoulders pop back, and he pushes me hard. And then I get upset. I'm like, you're not supposed to push that hard. And I full force throw him up against the wall. (laughs) Oh, gosh. And he gets up, just screams the word, relax. (laughs) Comes to tackle me. Literally like a cartoon, bounces off my stomach and falls on the floor. (laughs) Oh, gosh. So it's not very embarrassing for me. It's actually kind of complimentary for me, but <laughs> I mean, that's the weirdest thing I could remember in theater. That's really funny. Besides, man. besides the girls wearing cat ears. Yeah, <laughs> wearing cat ears. You, you, bro. I don't know how they had in private school, but public school, every other girl wore fucking cat ears. No, man, that that wasn't a thing for us. Really? I, I mean, honestly, like girls had to wear pants, so I don't really. <laughs> I don't, I, Wait, I didn't, you didn't see the bottom of their ass cheek? I, dude, I didn't see the bottom of an ankle until I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> Why are they wearing tube socks to the beach, mom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't that bad, but it was pretty bad for sure. <laughs> we were doing a play and a buddy of mine was like, dude, on this last time that you do this, I want every single one of your lines to end with naked. And so I was like, all right. And I was the freaking lead. So like every single line, like it got to the point where the audio, where I would look out, break the fourth wall. <laughs> The audience was like naked. (laughs) (laughs) It was so freaking stupid. Um, I remember that, but I only did that because it was like the last show and and it was like, screw it. I'm a freaking senior. Who cares? (laughs) You know? Okay. This isn't necessarily theater. Yeah. But I I, I mean, I'm a yes man. I'm a yes man at heart. Yeah. I, improv. It's what we learn improv. Yes and. It, yes of and. Of course. Always say yes and take the character farther. So my TV production teacher, for the, the head of the warning announcements, says we need to do a commercial to advertise the homecoming dance. The homecoming theme was under the sea. My dad. Since Back to the Future, it's been under the sea. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same theme every of time. Hey, man, of course. <laughs> and then we invented a rock song. I don't know. I don't know. I forgot the song. I forgot the <laughs> song you invented. Oh, the... the Chuck Berry song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Johnny B. Good. Chuck is your cousin. <laughs> yeah. No. So we're doing Under the Sea. My dad, like the week before, was a pirate for Halloween. Okay. So I came in dressed as a pirate, and I, I sang a... Like, yo ho, yo ho, homecomings coming up. <laughs> and what? I, <laughs> That's the worst song. It was a great song. It was very long. <laughs> it was like a 30 second long song of homecoming and where to get your tickets. Super, superb writing. <laughs> but by the end of it, everyone just called me the butt pirate. Oh my gosh, for, that's not good. For about the, the next three months until I embarrassed myself again on TV. I forgot what I did, but. It was whatever embarrassing thing I did on TV, (laughs) they would just riff off that. So I was the butt pirate in in high school for a good four months. Oh, my gosh. We've talked about, like, things at school. When you you would come home 
from like elementary or high school or whatever, what were your fandoms? Like what were the things that you would have to watch on television, things like that? The Simpsons started at the, on the CW, I think at, at 3.30. Yeah. So I needed to be home at 3.30 to watch The Simpsons. Okay. And my mom was the type of mom, like I said, she's a teacher. She said, do your homework, then watch TV. I said, I'll do my homework in my room. Yeah. And I would watch The Simpsons. You had a TV in your room? Oh, fuck yeah. Oh, man, you got so lucky. Bro, you went to a private school. Relax. <laughs> you probably had a plasma in your room before there was plasma. No, I, I went to a private school uh, not because uh, of money, but because my parents are so conservative Christian that they would rather pay for private school so I'd learn about Jesus <laughs> than to go to a pro public school where my, my mind can be tampered with. <laughs> Oh, shit. Okay. So, so all the money went to that. and Exactly. Not, so the money my parents saved on private school, they put on a TV in my room. Ex <laughs> so I could I watch The Simpsons. Yeah. I couldn't. I actually, I told this story on the podcast. I couldn't watch The Simpsons. Uh, I wasn't allowed to. So I would, uh, I would get the talk boy from Home Alone 2, and I would record it while I was doing homework. And then I would listen to The Simpsons at night. Yeah. Which is really stupid because that show is very, like, physical. It's very physical, visual, yeah. yeah. Very visual. Like, you can't, you just hear sound effects and you're like, I mean, I guess. <laughs> Bro, I wasn't allowed to watch Family Guy. Why is that? My dad saw one episode of Family Guy. And I had been watching it for, for months. And my dad saw one episode of Family Guy with me on my, on my request. Yeah. I said, Dad, you got to watch this show. It's hilarious. And I was about... 11 and it was an episode where quagmire sent meg and chris on a on a scavenger hunt yeah and it ended up being just getting a bunch of stuff of lois's yeah and he put up a shrine and he started jacking off i remember that and my dad saw that episode <laughs> oh, no. and my dad said what is this rated tv 14 you're not allowed to watch this till you're 15 yeah. <laughs> and the day I got my learner's permit, I was honest to him. I, I watched Family Guy again. That's really funny. Any other like movies or fandoms that you were really into? I was huge on, on Rugrats. Yeah. Which is great because you're wearing a Reptar shirt. I am. I, I was huge on but that Rugrats was a family thing. Yeah, of course. Where every night the family would get together. We all needed to be done with homework and dinner needed to be made and eaten by the time Rugrats came on. Yeah. That was that was a big thing for my family. Like I'll, I had all the orange VHS tapes of all the Rugrats movies. That's cool. The the Vegas, the Paris, mm -hmm. all of uh, the the Rugrats go wild. I had everything. Yeah. Rugrats and that that was a big part of my childhood. Rugrats. Yeah. You were more of a Nick kid then. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I didn't watch Disney Channel until middle school. Okay. And why why was that? Cuz you were just like Selena Gomez. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> I don't know what happened, but for the longest time, I thought Boy Meets World. I saw the I saw a commercial for a scary movie. Yeah, and I thought that was a commercial for Boy Meets World. What? And I'm like, I'm never gonna watch anything on Disney Channel if that's if that's their big sick ticket item. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. not doing Disney Channel. Fuck that. Yeah, I'll go to their parks and that's it. Yeah, and I remember middle school. Uh, I fucking I put it on. I, I started watching Boy Meets World. And I was like, oh, this isn't a scary movie at all. Yeah. And I got it. And Boy Meets World brought me to Disney Channel, which brought me to Boy Oing with. Yeah. <laughs> with the <laughs> with big Wizards Awards. of Waverly Place. Yeah, and Wizards of Waverly Place. Yeah, Boy Meets World is probably still one of my favorite shows of all time. Like, I, I strive to find my Topanga Lawrence, you know? You know, that so. fucking pisses me off because everyone's like, oh, I want to have the, the Marshall and Lily relationship. It's yeah. like, no, they weren't perfect for each other. <laughs> really? Why is that? Well, she, she kept breaking up with him. Yeah, that's true. And then he's had this goal for his entire life. For the entire duration of the show, we knew he wanted to be a lawyer and a judge. She just started wanting to be... Uh, like a, an art connoisseur. We get that yeah, she wanted to be an artist, but she gave up on that. And then now all of a sudden she wants to sell paintings and ruin Marshall's career as a judge. Yeah. Give me a break. <laughs> Marshall and Lily suck. <laughs> that's fair enough. But, but that's how I met your mother though. Like that show, that show was so annoying. Like the way that it ended. <laughs> it was the worst. It was very like, Oh, I didn't need to see past the first episode. Thanks.
Awesome. <laughs> oh, that was it. Yeah, that was that was the whole oh, okay. thing. Thanks. <laughs> no, Topanga, Topanga, uh, Corey and Topanga are the way to go. Yeah, for sure. They're the way to go. Because, like, there's even episodes in the later seasons when they became, like, adults where they they have arguments. And there's even, I, I remember Sean, the character Sean, he's telling Corey, like, if you guys are having a fight, just close the doors, close the blinds, and no one goes to bed until the fight's over. Just do it. And then you see this montage of them fighting. Um, I mean, granted, like, it's not like, you know, it's not like those montages where people are changing clothes and I'm walking on sunshine is playing. <laughs> but <laughs> it was like, you see, like, a montage of them being like, I just don't understand, and, like, this and that and the other thing. And then finally they just, like, they come to a grips where they're just like, look, I, I love you and, and you love me and that's the reason why we're here and that's it, you know? And I think it was because uh, Corey was so frustrated that he wasn't, he didn't have a job and he couldn't find a way to make money to support and everything that Topanga was doing was making money for the house and supporting the house. That's called and, the dream. Yeah. And so, <laughs> but, but he was like, I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to be the one to protect you and I can't protect you. So that's why he was upset. Which is something that I relate to because I that's how I am, you know, like I'm very, you know, one of the reasons why I don't seek out a relationship now is because I don't feel like I can protect the person, you know, which is stupid, but it's true. That's the reason why. Man, you know? I think I don't think you need to wait to get in a relationship so you can protect her because my girlfriend's a third degree black belt. That's awesome. Raise your hand if you're doing any protecting in that relationship. That's her raising her hand, bro. <laughs> No, I'm not doing I, shit. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean protection in in the sense of like se- financial security and like uh, emotional security, like all these different kinds of things. Things that you know, I mean, at the end of the day, like I can kick a guy in the nuts and be okay. You, you know, need to, you need to do what I did, which is marry. It is called an investment. <laughs> Ready? Go to like a law school orientation. Yeah. And find a girl that you know is going to do well in law school <laughs> or medical school or nursing school. That's Just great. a profession that pays well. Go to the orientation. You got to be, be with them and deal with them for the three, four years it takes to graduate. Uh, it's, it'll, that'll pass. <laughs> and then you got a girl with a lot of money. And that, you know, you, you were there before she was rich. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I do with my wife. That's that's so freaking funny. She just graduated law school, so the investment's about to start paying off. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, for sure. No, but yeah, I'm not. It, she's like I said, she's a third degree black belt. Yeah. I, if my shoes got stepped on, it's the opposite. I say, babe, go kick his ass. <laughs> These are my Yeezys. <laughs> <laughs> babe, uh, he looked at me the wrong way. Go <laughs> fuck him up. <laughs> Do you remember all the different weird commercials from the 90s? I just never understood the Cinnamon Toast Crunch commercials. Dude. Because here's here's my quarrel with them. Yeah, yeah. Ready? They get a profession, a guy that can see the smallest minutia of any teensy detail, but he can't see what it takes us no telescopes or binoculars to see, which uh-huh. is the taste of the Cinnamon Toast Crunch. He's like, do you remember these commercials? Yeah, I do. It was every time it was, oh, we have a forensics investigator and he's used in the microscope to look at the Cinnamon Toast Crunch. He's like, <laughs> oh, I don't see anything. And then the kids pull it out. It's like, look, it's the taste you can see. And it's got the swirls on it. And it was like, oh, I didn't see that. But if it's the taste you can see, he should be able to see it. <laughs> That's very true. That pissed me off as a kid. I was a kid like, if it's the taste you can see, why is your whole marketing scheme about people that see really well not seeing it? Yeah. Well, what's what's really funny is as an adult, I finally realized that kids, com- kids commercials and kids television is really predicated on making adults look stupid. Really? Yeah, because the kid is supposed to know more. You know, oh, yeah. when you really think about that it, makes sense. All those, wise. all those Disney shows, the parents always the bumbling idiot that's like, "Don't the talk. I don't know what to do." Like, what? I guess you're grounded. <laughs> you know, like the kids never get in trouble for anything they do. Like it's like you blew up the bank, <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> I guess you're grounded. It's like in Mean Girls. 
I didn't know what grounding meant. <laughs> she was grounded. You can't let her go out to the math competition. Which, if you're grounded, let your kid go to a math competition, right? Yeah, of course. It should be punishment for <laughs> <laughs> to go to a math competition. That's... <laughs> Well, that's Mean Girls. That's way after our childhood. Yeah. No, I mean, that's totally fine. We can talk about anything. But to transition into everything, because we were talking about cereal, one of the bits that we like to do here is we like to eat cereal and review it. Yeah. So, have you heard the show before? Yeah. Okay. So, you, Dick. Know, you know what we're going to do. So, I spoke to my sponsors over at Funko. And by by sponsors, I mean I like them. And by spoke to, I mean I tweeted them repeatedly and they didn't get back to me. Of course. So uh, what I chose for you was a, I usually like to pick a cereal that pertains to my guest. So what I chose for you was Funko brand Beetlejuice cereal. So, and here's the reason why. Reason why is because uh, you're really funny, but you kind of scare me. <laughs> Why? And also because I had to ask you three times to do the podcast. <laughs> uh, nice. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> it's not because like it's a mo- like you're a monster or anything, but it's just like I I get very intimidated <laughs> around you. But at mm-hmm. the same time, I think you're hilarious. Why? I don't know. I just I get intimidated around everyone. To be I'm honest, I'm a physical specimen. That's true. That is very true. I'm six for all of our listeners. I'm six four mm. two eighty. Yeah. Of lean muscle. <laughs> of lean of lean muscle man meat. Bro, I haven't so, been in the 200s in a minute, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to pour some of this cereal into my Reptar cereal bowl, and I'm going to p- record it, and hopefully all the ASMR people can... I was going to say, why don't you do it... Um, he's putting the <laughs> cereal in the bowl. <laughs> I don't know if it, if it picked up, but... No, it did. So um, he, he put the cereal... In the bowl. <laughs> I love ASMR, dude. All those, <laughs> there's I like love it. way too much moaning. <laughs> A lot of breathing. It piss- and the, I hate that. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true. So, oh, is this a, the toy? Yeah, that is a that is a cereal prize. So it will be fun to review the cereal. But what will be more fun is for you to review the cereal as Beetlejuice. And not to mention, I think you're so good at voices, so I think you're going to kill this. Whenever you're ready. All right. It's got a nice crunch to it, huh? Got a nice crunch, a nice bunch with a bunch and a crunch. (laughs) I love the music. It is very good. It's very sticky. I don't know if you've ever gone downstairs, you know what the sticky feels like. (laughs) Gets my fingers sticky like I just played with a girl's mom. <laughs> That's so Beetlejuice. Really? Yes. Thank God. I saw him for two seconds. That is so Beetlejuice. Oh, my God. Beetlejuice, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you personally each with my fingers <laughs> that are very sticky. That I don't is, know what he sounds like, bro. Dude, that is 100% exactly like the humor, everything. That's exactly what he is. Well, He's I saw a little bit of him talking to Alec very, Baldwin. Yeah, very, very gross and sexual. Ironically, the movie is called Beetlejuice. He's in the movie for eight minutes and 30 seconds. Really? He's barely in the movie. It's like not even really about him. Is it know? about sexy Alec Baldwin? It's about sexy Alec Baldwin and his wife. What's it? Okay, wait. Can you can you explain? Give me a quick synopsis. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, what happens is they buy. Can a, I keep it in the cereal? Of course you can. They, it, it's yours. This is yours to keep. They buy a new house, and like every scary movie, uh, the house is haunted. Um, but they can't leave the house because you know the, thirty year fixed mortgage. Of the worst. Yeah, and the rent is so cheap. You know, so uh, and then for. They're driving over to a hardware store to get something, and they get into a car crash, and and they die. And then the movie is them trying to reconcile with death. So, like, they're ghosts the whole movie. And so they're trying to reconcile with with death and, like, how to Is that a spoiler, like, Sixth Sense spoiler, or... No, no, no. That's, like, a thing. Everyone knows they're dead. It is, like, in the the first half of the first act. Like, that's what happens. So, and then... Uh, they start to see uh, other people coming into the house to buy the house, and and 
if they don't like the people, they start haunting the people. It be it's a comedy, so they they. It's also a Tim Burton comedy, so it's oh, no, it's, yeah. it's like really weird. You didn't have to tell me that. <laughs> If you've seen what Beetlejuice looks like, you know this is... This is Tim Burton. This is what happens when Tim Burton comes. Exactly. He gets Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah. He calls his cum Beetlejuice. That's, that actually is... Before he had his first kid, he said Beetlejuice three times. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> you want to see my Beetlejuice? <laughs> Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> oh, my God. Oh my gosh! Um, it seems like a. But then, why is he? Why is he the name of the movie if if he's not in it? I have no clue. I mean, it's kind of like. I mean, there's a lot of movies that are like that. I mean, like Silence of the Lambs. Uh, Hannibal Lecter isn't in the movie for very long. He's only in it for like six or seven minutes, something like that. What is wrong with these directors? Yeah, and is, like, he, is there a Beetlejuice too? No. Not yet, but there's supposed to be one called Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian, and no one wants to see that. Get so. the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be the best movie of all time. Yeah. Kevin Smith was supposed to, Kevin Smith talked about it in one of his podcasts where he was supposed to direct the, he went to Warner Brothers, and Warner Brothers was like, we have two great movies for you to direct. One of them is Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian, and the other one was a movie where it starred Michael Jackson and he could transform into a car and then a kid would get inside of the car. And he's like, oh. and he's like, back then I didn't want to direct that. Now I totally want to direct that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like revenge for the kid. Exactly. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Can I, tell you, I have a, a whole Michael Jackson bit that I'm working on. Okay. That sounds amazing. It doesn't. It doesn't? It Why? doesn't. Because... All right, so I can't when when you're hosting yeah. uh, a room, you can't you you got to be all inclusive. You got to say material that's for everyone. Of course, this material I cannot say there. <laughs> can I run it by you? Yeah, you can. Of course. All right, so the premise is, <laughs> I think the kids funded an entire documentary to brag about their childhood. <laughs> that's so messed up. <laughs> I explain. Okay. <laughs> Please this do. kid looks dead in the camera that he paid to be there mm -hmm. to say that he got the whip from Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. the iconic red thriller jacket, and he got a blowjob from Michael Jackson. Like, <laughs> dude, if that's not the perfect childhood, I don't know what life you're living. <laughs> you know what's funny is like, I mean, I'm laughing because I'm a comic and I understand comedy, you know, but but a lot of people think comedy is a TED talk now. Did I just so, ruin your Funko sponsorship? You, with that? No, no, you didn't. And not at all. They're not really a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know they're sponsoring yeah, yet. Yeah, I sponsor them. <laughs> but yeah, that's actually really funny. I actually think that that's super clever. Bro, I keep going with it and it's. It hasn't worked yet, but I believe in it so much. <laughs> it hasn't worked yet. It hasn't worked yet, man. But I believe in that bit so much. I'm not going to. Man, that's a really good question. Because, and, and I want to start talking about comedy now. Because every comic has a joke that they, like, really believe in. But it just doesn't work. And, like, the one joke that I have, I want to say that I wrote the premise of it before I even started stand-up. And every now and again, I'll try it, and it never works. And I hate that it doesn't work because it's such – I think it's such a good idea. It's a Batman joke, and, and I've tried reframing it as, like, you know, if I were Bruce Wayne or, like, you know, what if this was the movie instead, like, all these things. But the premise of the joke is that the real origin story of Batman shouldn't have been that he saw his parents die and then he becomes Batman. It should be that he got scared of the play – Right. And then his parents die. So to seek revenge, he goes back to the play and then he's like, I'm going to become the lead in that play. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just becomes a completely different movie. <laughs> and then <clears throat> and then and then I play out what it would actually be. And, it, and it's me like doing musical theater as as a bat and i'm like i am the night i am the darkness in the shadows i'm a fearless guy like i'm doing <laughs> all that stuff and like it never works like bro <laughs> I, I i have so many of those yeah there's one that i loved because 
It just it, it made me laugh, and I can't remember it for the life of me now, so I shouldn't have brought that one up. So I'll pretend I'm talking about this one. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> you ever you ever go to CVS? Yeah. Or Walgreens? Mm-hmm. You know how they always ask you, do you have a card? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever told them no? I always tell them I have a phone number. Yeah. All right. Next time you go, tell them no. Okay. Because every single time I tell them no, this wasn't this this just happened. It wasn't. I'm not exaggerating for comedy. They would just look so offended. <laughs> like, hey, do you have Walgreens card? And I guess because they're so spoiled and used to hearing yes all the day, they they be like, do you have Walgreens card? Because they're all Hispanic and where I come from. Yeah, that's true. And I go, no, 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 just ring it up. <gasps> do you don't? Do you do not have a a Walgreens card? Where is the? And and I would go into them being like super self self introspective. That's like. Did I do something that yeah. you don't have a Walgreens card? And yeah. Just what did I do to you, honestly, to deserve that you don't have a Walgreens card? Yeah. And I'd go off on them and where it came from. And it just, it never worked. Yeah. But the truth of it, that they all get so offended when you don't have a Walgreens card, made me believe in it so much. And I <laughs> wasted so many sets trying to make it work. And it never, it never I will, worked. I will say this, though. It is really annoying that they care so much about you f- saving 13 cents. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's not, <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. Like, uh, you know what that reminds me of? It's, it's like if you go to Bed Bath & Beyond and you don't have a coupon. Ooh. You know? Have you ever seen that? Yeah, they, n- I, d- I haven't. Like, if you... <laughs> they mail them if shit. You, yeah, th- well, that's what I'm saying. It's like, everyone has a coupon. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, if you don't have a coupon, they're like, y- you're just going to pay full price for these for these sheets and linens? <laughs> and, you're, and you're just like, yeah, I, I don't have a coupon. And like, people... <laughs> there's a there's a comedian, John Panette, I think, has a joke about this, where he's like, people in line will be like, do you want to use my coupon? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's like so strange to not have a coupon at that freaking store. Like... Who, has anyone ever paid full price there? <laughs> when did you start doing stand-up? I started on my 21st birthday. So really? four years ago. Okay. Yeah. Holy cow. On my 21st birthday, there was an open mic. And I it was, it, was, it was a bringer open mic, too. Apparently, it was a club that used to be affiliated with the improv. And then they a cut ties. A open mic. That's so it was, it, was, it was very much like they have at the, at the improvs now. They got to bring 10 people. But yeah, this but one, that's you only not to really. Five. It's not really an open mic. It's like a new faces, like showcase. yeah. Well, this was a comedy club. Okay. In, in Can- like they had the brick wall and the stage. Okay. And they would get BC list comedians to come out every weekend. Okay, cool. It was a legit club, so I was like, all right, I'll bring the five. Yeah. And so I brought six people, and I I, I did really well. Okay. I had no sense of comedy, but it was my twenty first birthday. I was like, what I want to do is I want to get into stand up. I've, I've been waiting long enough. I, I want to do it. So I did about four minutes. And just my confidence alone made people like me. But I think I had, I was so into storyteller comedians yeah. that I, in four minutes, I think I had two punchlines. Yeah. So it was a ramble, 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 punchline. That was okay. And then a ramble, ramble punchline to another punchline. That was good. But other than that, it was like, I kind of sucked. Yeah. But I, in my head, I did well because sure. people were laughing and shit, you know, you know, when you're on a, when you, when you're in a, when you're in, when you're in the right vibe and you're in the right mood. And you look into the crowd and people are just vibing to what you're saying. Mm-hmm. That's how it was. So yeah. I, I wasn't really getting a lot of laughs, but I felt the good vibes in the crowd. People tell me, oh, man, you did well out there. So I felt really good. The second time I did an open mic was two weeks after, and I absolutely bombed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tanked so hard that I didn't do stand-up for two months. Wow. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, I was like, I think I should stop this. And then... You know, I got back into it and I fell in love with it again. And was that the worst bomb you've ever had? When it comes to scale, no. Okay. But uh, as far as performance, I think that might have been. That's what I always go to. Yeah. I always go to that one. Where you're just like, dang, man. Like, was like, it as bad as my second time on stage? Nah, not really. Yeah. But the biggest one to scale was, I was a year into stand up. Yeah. And a buddy of mine was part of the FIU homecoming committee and he got me the gig to open up for Nick Swardson. Whoa, that's a huge gig. I had to do 30 minutes. <laughs> and I was on stage for I 30 had, minutes. And I had but I had 5 minutes of material. <laughs> Bro. 
I remember prepping saying, all right, this joke's bad, but it's, it, but I'll follow it with a good joke. Like, I knew my mm-hmm. jokes weren't going to get laughs, oh, man. but I knew I had to be on there for 30 minutes. God, that's a bummer. And, I mean, since then, I I just did, and it's crazy because I just did on Wednesday 30 minutes at the improv. Yeah. And and it's crazy how far I've gone to where. Yeah, 30, for minutes, 30 minutes for you is, is easy now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I and I'm getting, I, I not to be cocky, but was, I had a really good show of course, from yeah. the beginning when the girl was like, oh, I think I uh, like just I, I, the crowd and I were in a good mood. So I'm doing 30 minutes at the improv and in my head, I'm like, I couldn't fucking do this in front of 3000 people yeah. at, FI, at the FIU basketball stadium. Oh like, what the God. fuck? It was 3000. And everyone was like, oh, you did great. Because, again, I had the confidence. I was up there having a good time. But looking back on it now, it's like. Man, you were a piece of shit that you thought you could get on that stage, huh? <laughs> yeah, it, it really is like a lot of it is confidence. You know, of course, it's jokes and things like that. But a lot of it is confidence, man. Like the the person that is so good at this that I, and I, I go back talking about this in, in the podcast many times. But the person that I'm so jealous of is Chris D'Elia. Like he's so good at jealous in a good way like just he has so much confidence that he can talk about instead of talking about negativity which is what a lot of comedians do can talk about positive things and make them funny and you know like i i saw him on the fall of the leader tour twice he's he's i've seen him maybe five or six times so far uh i i started watching him after he came out with his first special and I saw him at in Orlando at the Hard Rock with my best friend, and I remember after the show, <laughs> he was like, man, that was really funny, and then I, I had a real thought in my head. I don't know if I told him out, out loud, but I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to be that funny. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, <so bad. laughs> like, I was like, 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 and and to be honest, like to to put it in a po- more positive light, I'll probably be that funny to someone else. Oh, okay. But I'll never be that funny to me. You know what Man, I mean? That's so <laughs> sad, kind of. <laughs> because like I've never made myself, I've never made myself laugh so hard that I had a headache. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I've had other people make me laugh so hard that I've that I've gotten into a headache, but never myself. You know, I. There's plenty of things that I say that I laugh at. That I laugh at myself all the time, but I rarely ever think I'm that funny, you know. Well, Cristalia is, is got to be up there as yeah. far as comics now. A comic that made uh, so the f- I've only had to leave a stand up show, mm-hmm. and they're both I was watching on TV, but like, I had to like stop twice. And the one was the first one was I was, I was probably 13, 14. Yeah. And I was watching Jim Gaffigan special. Mm-hmm. And it was the Hot Pocket special. That, That's so that good. That one. And I'm watching the whole thing, and I legit got chest pains from yeah. laughing so hard. My face hurt. Yeah. And this is before streaming and, and DVR. So I had to legit leave the room to catch my breath and come in. That's great. And then the other one was Burt Kreischer's newest special, Secret Time. Yeah. On Netflix. So good. I was watching it with my wife. And her and I were laughing so hard, we paused it. Man. And it was paused for about good five minutes. Yeah. And we were still, like, getting the laughter out. Yeah. Just, (sighs) okay, I think we can press play now. That dude is, I would say him and maybe Gabriel Iglesias are, like, the freaking Mount Rushmore of storyteller comedians that are just so good. Yeah. Kreischer's so good. I can hear them talk for three hours. He mentors other stand-up comics. Yeah. On how to tell stories, like uh, Brendan Schaub, who I've had the the opportunity to, to open for. I, I know, yeah. A, he was telling me that he would go to Kreischer's house. Yeah. And Kreischer would help him punch up stories to the point where on, on Brendan's special, he's cited as one of the, as like a th- thanks to, or yeah, I think it's like a thanks to Brian Callen, Burt Kreischer. Yeah. And those are the only comics, I believe, and Joe Rogan. Yeah. That yeah. are on, it's like. No well, one those knows are the three how that broke him. Yeah. No one knows how good of a storyteller Burt Kreischer is. Oh yeah. Unless you until you until you see it. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, that or like, I mean, if you're if you're a comic and you understand, you know how the gravity of how difficult it is to get somebody to give a crap about anything you have to say for five minutes, let alone two hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
And and he's just so good at it, man. Like him and, and Iglesias, man. Like Iglesias, the only difference is Iglesias has more of an international audience. Oh yeah. You know, like like he can he can get the Latinx people and Americans and, you know, the, the black people, everyone, you know. Um where Kreischer is more of like the American, you know, kind of audience. You ever when it comes to storytelling, because you have some of your bits are, are nice. They they're not five. I haven't heard a five minute long bit because we yeah. usually only have five ten minutes on exactly. stage. Exactly. Yeah. But do you do you have those bits where you like to? It's kind of the opposite idea, but I know Andrew Schultz does it. Yeah. Kreischer does it. I, I love doing it where you kind of bask in a little bit of silence. Yeah. Well, if I really if I really wanted to do stand up the way that the way that I want to, where I was, where I was given a good 20 minutes or 30 minutes, I would have stories where I bask in silence. Well, I, I was in a, I was doing, I was doing a set and it's, it's, a, it's an older joke of mine, but I, I still love it. It's, it's a, it's a four minute long story of uh, my encounter with an indoor skydiving facility. Yeah. That's and the joke. very end of it, it, I, I, I get really serious with the audience mm. and I bask in silence and I, and I use the silence and I create tension and I build tension and then I break it with a, with a punchline. Yeah. A punchline that usually works. Yeah. I got criticized by a woman who books for a very prominent club mm -hmm. because she was there and heard it. She's like, oh, he was quiet for too long. And I was like, you don't understand that I'm doing that on purpose? Yeah. Because the... It, the punchline ends up hitting harder at the end because I'm, I'm creating so much tension. I'm, I'm building the suspense to hit you out of left field with what I say next. Mm -hmm. It's like, and that upset me. And I remember I was talking to another guy who was listening who books for another club. And he's like, I, I fucking loved it. I don't know what she was talking about. To me, that's what makes the bit. Yeah. And I was like, it, it's crazy how, you know, art is something that one guy can look at a painting. Another guy can look at a painting, two completely different opinions. And I never really thought of stand-up as that. I knew stand-up was an art, but I never really thought stand-up was the kind of person thing that, you know, it's for one. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, to me, stand-up is very black and white. Yeah. You laugh or you don't laugh. It's funny or it's not funny. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty universal thing. And this was a first moment. I was just having a couple of weeks ago where I was like, shit, like, how can someone get it so easily and another person just not get it at all? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I think that, and I I could be completely wrong, but I think Miami is a very special place for comedy right now. Uh, in that, I don't know if a lot of Miami understands what comedy is, you yeah. know, um, because a lot of people that I've come across usually think that comedy is something where the comic will make fun of you or something like that rather than like, oh, I'm going to learn a little bit about this guy's story, or he's going to say something that has a truth nugget, but it's also a satire. <laughs> so, like, I, I can't really, you know, some some people are like, some people think comedy is a TED Talk, you know, and and it's strange, you know. Um, did you know Andrew Schultz actually had to do it? Not had to, I think he wanted to. He did a TED Talk. Yeah, that would be great. That's great. I saw it. It's like an 11-minute TED Talk. And I'm like, man, that's that's crazy because we all joke around yeah. like that people want a TED talk and he came out and did a fucking TED talk on the TED talks YouTube page. That's so funny. <laughs> it's so wild. Yeah, man. Like it's just, it's something where like everyone thinks that you're being serious sometimes. And that's not, that's not always the truth. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, your bit about Michael Jackson. It's a very Bill Burr way of, doing a joke where it's like you start with the offensive thing and then you explain why and then you're like i mean he's got a point though yeah you know what i mean <laughs> that's so, that's my that's the ideal for that bit exactly because like you know that's the whole thing with with bill burr like he's like screw women's rights and like screw this <laughs> and that and it's like but not really you know it's just like these specific things about it you know <laughs> and that's why it's like well i mean he definitely has a point you know yeah but but the opening statement is always like yeesh you know <laughs> well, is, it, is it bill burr the one that says uh, uh fuck equal pay equal pay isn't exactly. supposed to be because 
You don't hear women complaining about it in like porn and modeling and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Is that Bill Burr's bit? Yeah, and then he has the bit about like uh, he's like, why is there some unspoken secret that if there's if there's a shipwreck that all the all the women and the children have to go and I can't save myself? <laughs> <laughs> that isn't fair. That's not <laughs> you fair <know>? at all. <laughs> Like you, but what what yeah. are we? We're just we're just straight white men. What do we, what do we know? <laughs> yeah, that's true. With with Spanish last names, you know. <laughs> but that's just what it is. Tell me some funny stories or embarrassing. St- I know you have a story where we did. I don't know if we did the show together, but there was a show where there was a uh, a mac and cheese truck. I don't know if you want to tell that story on here or not. I, I can say it. But it's a real good one. I love this story, man. Yeah. I love this story. So I'm 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 a pretty woke dude. Yeah. It's on my Instagram handle. I'm woke as fuck. Yeah. I right? I can actually attest to this. In fact, the the podcast that you don't do anymore, uh the old wooden ship, that was the most woke podcast. It was very woke. It was the it's most as woke, woke pod- as it gets. Exactly. And being saying that, I can't fucking stand Winwood. Mm-hmm. I can't stand the Winwood people. I can't stand the Winwood environment. It's like you're walking down Winwood, and this isn't part of the story. There's actually you're walking down Winwood with a group of people. With the, if you're walking with the Winwood people, yeah. they'll be looking down. And it's like, oh my god, look at this. this is on the sidewalk, I can't believe they let this this piece of beautiful piece of art on the sidewalk. I can't believe it. It's like, dude, that's a homeless guy. She's yeah. like, ill gross. And then she walks away. That's the epitome yeah. of a Winwood person. Yeah. No, I, I actually, I have a joke about it. I, I wrote it while I was in Los Angeles, but Winwood is the equivalent to Silver Lake in Los Angeles. And you, they're like the hipster town. And you can Ugh. always tell that it's a hipster town because it seems like all the homeless people have jobs. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that! Oh, fuck! Like, that's why are the homeless people doing a science experiment to give me coffee? You know, <laughs> shave, bitch. <laughs> so I'm doing a show in Winwood, at a place that's no longer around. So I can say it's called the Winwood Yard. Yeah, and they're actually about to open up a Doral Yard. So I hope I get booked there. <laughs> <laughs> and the way this place works is it's a fucking it's an empty lot with a bar right in the middle. And then food trucks on, along the perimeter. Yeah. And so if you're and so you can sit. They got tables in between the bar and the and the food trucks, and then a stage right at the front of this, at the, the front of this lot. And I'm on stage. There's like ten yards and then tables. So I'm already disconnected. It's in the middle of the day. So already disconnect. Middle of the day. Already disconnected because of that. The distance I have with the people and no one's there for a comedy show. <laughs> But I get on stage, and the microphone's very loud, so people start listening a little bit. And when I'm at a bar, I don't like doing my material, especially if I'm only doing five, ten minutes because my material's long. Yeah. you got to pay attention for my material. So when I'm at a bar, I do a lot of crowd work, things that are just quick hitters that everyone can understand, and we can all get along and, and have a good day. So the first thing I see when I get on stage is this first table to my, bo- to my right, and it's a round table. And in order for what I saw was a big black guy, Mm -hmm. a small, very thin redhead girl, a very fat, tan skin, not very fat, but like a fat, tan skin, uh, Hispanic looking girl. Yeah. An Asian dude, an Asian girl, a ginger guy and a black girl and a white girl. Very diverse table. Yeah. So I say. What the fuck? Did you guys just come from a college? Did you guys just come from a college brochure photo shoot? That's <laughs> so good. Because that kind of diversity isn't natural. Yeah. I true. love it, but it's not natural. It is apparently, though, in Winwood because they turn around. Big black dude got like big dude. Turns around and says, not today, bro. Not today. I'm like, what? Did you just get cut from the football team? Who the fuck would cut you? Why are you so upset? You're, you can kick anyone's ass in here. Have a good time. He's like, nah, not today, not today. And I go, okay, it's going to be one of those shows. Yep. So I go to another table. They're not having it. It's another group of young kids at the bar. They're not having it. Finally, I see these two old Hispanic ladies in the front that have been laughing the whole time. And I say, hey, mujeres, ladies, (laughs) you know that sign in the front said Winwood Yard, not La Carreta, right? Like, I know you're old and your vision might be going bad but this isn't your place you understand you're too old to be here and they love it and i'm like yeah. all right so it's not me it's not me it's not me 
but I say, I, let's, I forget about, I, I remember what millennials hate and that's themselves. Yeah. So I can't make fun of millennials because I'll always be wrong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make fun of the environment. I make fun of, I st- so I say, I'm going to start going off on the environment. That's something that has nothing to do with them. They could laugh at. So the first thing I saw was a mac and cheese food truck. Yeah. World fame, uh, the house of Mac is what it's called. Again, I don't want to ruin any sponsorships here, but it's the House of Mac, and it's the only one I saw because it was the only place with unhealthy food. So immediately, I was intrigued by them from when I first <laughs> stepped into Winwood Yard. Yeah. And I remember going up to the menu, and I'm on stage remembering when I went and ordered food, the first thing on their menu is world-famous mac and cheese. I'm like, I can make fun of this. So I'm on stage, and I say, uh, big shout-out to House of Mac being here. You know, the first thing on their menu, they love their world-famous mac and cheese. It's crazy how something world famous can only have two Yelp reviews. <laughs> Big black dude. I keep saying black because I'm very specific and I yeah. want you to think of it from a white guy. That's just what it is, though. Like, yeah, it's not- but it, because I say black, people call me racist because I'm stating facts. Whatever. <laughs> That's so dumb. But if I say African-American, I sound even more racist. I don't know, dude. Yeah. So he walks out. He steps out of the food truck and says, don't fuck with black businesses. Right. I am so taken aback by what he just said because... Who wouldn't be? What? Yeah. So I straight up on stage, I go, what? Yeah. And he says again, verbatim, don't fuck with black businesses. And I go, I'm talking about mac and cheese. Since when is mac and cheese a black business? Yeah. I'm Hispanic. I've had mac and cheese my whole life. Don't take that from me. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have, people start going bad on me. Like, I hear some other people like, oh, oh, you fuck with black business. I was like, <laughs> all right, let me go to. The, so my genius brain, I go to the sushi place next door. So I start fucking with Asian businesses. <laughs> they, they didn't hear me. They squint too hard. They couldn't see me either. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going off on them and it's still in the back of my mind. And I'm like, fuck, I can't let this go. And I go back to House of Mac and go, fucking black business? Yeah. Why are you fucking, why are you saying black business? Why are you making it about race? And the part where I'm going wrong is saying into the mic, into a speaker, into a room of, into a crowd of people saying black. Yeah, yeah. Because you can't say that because, again, you're racist if you do. But I'm going, I'm like, black business? Don't call it a black business. Call it a mac and cheese business. Don't fuck it black. Get the fuck out of here. And I'm going off, off, off on these people. Yeah. As I'm going off, screaming the word black way too many times for a white person to say (laughs) the owner literally just walks in front of the stage and gives me the two fingers to come over here oh no and i said i'll show you what to do with those fingers no i'm kidding (laughs) she gets in front of she makes it very obvious in front of everyone to get off stage i put the mic down i say that's my time everyone fucking cheering that they got the big bad bully off stage yeah and i go off to the side and she's like so where uh, we can't have that kind of material said here. <laughs> you can't you can't stir up racial. You can't say black and you can't be, do racist comedy here. I'm like, he's the one yeah. that ruined my set by making things racial. Yeah. And she goes, yeah. So we're just not gonna pay you, and you're gonna have to leave now. And I, I, I spilled her beer and I walked out. That's like why that's messed up. I, that I spilled her beer? No, it's messed up that she didn't pay you. Well, I was supposed to host a whole event, and I didn't even finish my set, so I, it makes sense. Oh, okay. So it, you know, they so they stopped before the whole thing was over. Okay, because that's the thing where it's like, you know, you, you do your job, and it's like, well, I didn't like the job that you made. Well, cool. Uh, doesn't matter. I you need to pay me for the job that I did. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, if you want me to build you a pizza-looking house. Don't get mad that your house has crust and cheese and pepperoni yeah. and pineapple and, and ham on it. Yeah. You wanted a pizza house. You got a pizza house. Don't. Yeah. You, you, you said you wanted a stand-up comedian. When I was up there making jokes that you gave me no restrictions, I always ask, are there any restrictions? They didn't say anything. They didn't even say no bad words. And I was like, okay, this is going to be great. And then at the end, she's like, oh, you also curse too much. This is a family place. I'm like, well, you didn't tell me that earlier, yeah, bitch. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I didn't say bitch. I didn't say bitch. Yeah. I didn't say bitch. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, man. Dude, I think the worst show that I've ever had, I don't know if I've ever told you this story, 
the worst show I ever had was this show that was at some theater in, here in Miami. It was like an open audience audition because they wanted to do like a variety show. They wanted to have comedy and burlesque and, you know, singer songwriter, all that stuff. And I'm not like a, a baby, but I had been doing comedy for like a year and a half, two years. And I hadn't yet learned that variety shows aren't necessarily the best thing for stand up. you know? <laughs> yeah. Cause all, all like all arts open mics are the worst unless it's backroom sessions. It's like the worst thing in the I, world. I won't do any of them. Yeah. It's like, because no one, everyone is so freaking tight. Like it's like seventh grade prom. Everyone Be- is so tight because they'll always, at least for me, it just always happens. I'm going after a spoken word poet talking about fucking abortion or rape or you don't own my body. Yeah. My body is for me. Yeah. Not you. Poo poo. <laughs> and I'm like, I have to make jokes after this. Yeah. And then they I'm not saying snapping. it's bad. I'm not saying it's bad. Like, obviously, the poem I just did is better than anything they could do. But I'm not saying they're bad. <laughs> I'm saying for them to get the crowd so serious and then for us to go on and do fucking jokes, like the crowd doesn't want that. But <laughs> sorry, I interrupted. No, that's, that's, that's totally to... fine. That actually reminds me of 22 Jump Street. The best. <laughs> when Jonah Hill's scene. like, Julia Roberts, Julia Rob hurts. hurts. <laughs> and everyone's like snapping. And then you try to go up and, and do jokes. You're like, man, with all that snapping, thank God you're not Thanos. Am I right? And then everyone's <laughs> like, what the balls is this guy talking about? <laughs> You know, (laughs) so I'm at this show and I'm signing paperwork and this lady, as she's signing paperwork so I can get paid and do all these things, she's like, oh, by the way, don't let the gong intimidate you. And I go, what? And she says, don't let the gong intimidate you. And I said, what are you talking about? Turns out there was a huge gong, like Asian culture gong uh, on stage. And it turns out that if the audience didn't like the performance, they could raise up signs that said, bang that gong. And there was a person that was dressed like a ninja that would bang a gong. And then you, you basically didn't pass the audition or whatever. I love that he was dressed like a ninja. Very appropriate. Exactly. (laughs) So (laughs) the show starts, the show is, is filled. And also they've liquored all these people up. Dope. So everyone is drunk off their mind, right? And what I'm starting to notice is that if a comic goes up, since comedy has a second to two seconds of silence every now and again, it doesn't work because the, that audience felt very uncomfortable in silence. And also you can hear the audience when there isn't music playing or there isn't an instrument or there isn't something with a lot of noise happening, you know? So, which all the other acts had music or they, they were dancing or they were doing burlesque or whatever, whatever the case. So I was like, well, great. So this is basically rigged where every single comedian is going to fail. And so every single comedian was, was bombing. And finally (laughs) I, I went up, and I did my thing. Wait, question. Before you got up, were you like, not me, though? They're going to love me. Or were you like, I'm fucked? No, I I was like 95-5, where the 5% was like, maybe I can get them on my side. <laughs> I because, love that. Optimism. Because, but you know me. You know that I always have a little bit of an optimism, like a little bit of an optimistic side in my in my in myself you know maybe it's because i grew up religious i don't know <laughs> but it's just maybe like because god will always love me yeah i don't know yeah i don't know i mean you die you come back in three days like it's not <laughs> that's how it works for everyone right right it's not a big deal <laughs> so um so uh so i'm on stage and i don't do this was before i wrote the the work bit so i didn't do that the first joke I tell is the joke about me looking like the kid from up. Right. So it works, right? It works. It engages. I got one punchline out and I'm like, thank God. Okay. So let's keep going. And then I start setting up the next joke and I want to say I'm two sentences into the next setup 
and immediately I just start hearing boos and people with their signs up going, bang that gong, bang that gong, or whatever. And I'm just like, okay. And then I start, and then I start making fun of the fact, like what I was telling you, I start making fun of the fact that you guys are just upset with silence. Like you guys just don't like silence. And then, and then the audience is laughing at me saying that. And then they're also like, they're like agreeing, but also still telling the ninja to bang the gong. <laughs> and then, and then the, the ninja bangs the gong or whatever. And so I'm like, great, you know? And I felt really bad because technically I, I, it got to a point where people were, the standups were getting booed so much that I started timing how long they would be on stage and I would tell the comics, let's see who can stay on there the longest. And that's technically <laughs> who the best comedian was. I was the best comic. I was on stage for 23 seconds. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I was the longest standing comedian. <laughs> they gave you 23 seconds? Yeah, before they, before they bang the gong on me. And then, but this is the reason why it's the worst show ever. That's not even... T technically that's already a pretty bad bomb this is the reason why it's the worst show ever right after I i'm sitting in the front because everyone that's ta that is in the talent has to had to sit in the front and so there was a guy that came out and he did kind of like a uh not not burlesque but it's um drag drag yeah drag that's what it was and so he's doing he's doing his thing and he's dancing or whatever and he's like engaging with audience members and i'm i'm like really in my feelings and i'm really upset and i'm just like man this guy better not come up to me and he comes up to me and like starts like dancing on me and i'm just like you know i didn't say anything but i was just like i had a very like look of like not today like that kind of thing like not right now I guess the guy saw that or something and he just got <laughs> it, it it got it got to a point where he was in I, I'm trying to find the best way to describe it. He was in <laughs> oh a leather a leather thing, like a leather like almost girdle looking thing, and then he had leggings on. The underwear aspect of it was like a little too narrow for his balls dope you know <laughs> nope <laughs> and and uh he did this thing where he was like shimmying his butt and like touching his toes a little bit and he did that right in front of me right on the catwalk and he did something where he like moved his junk and his nuts hit the tip of my forehead <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so literally any time i bomb i'm like well at least i didn't get someone's nuts on my forehead you know <laughs> that's the worst bomb i've ever had that's usually a present <laughs> that's usually no, a sign of you doing something right no it was not Yo. it was not good it was you know it's funny he probably sitting there thinking this guy needs to pick me up <laughs> what better way to lift his spirits than my balls gently yeah. pressed on his forehead. <laughs> Give him a little tap tap. You know, it was it was real, real bad. That was like that's definitely the worst show. Did you I've say anything had. to him after? Like, no. thank you. <laughs> no, no. Thanks. <laughs> no, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything to anyone, actually. <laughs> the lady that booked the show ended up wanting to book me, but I was so upset with what happened. Gee, why? And that I just like I was like, I don't want to be a part of this show. Like, if this is what it's going to be, there's no reason for me to ever be a part of this. <laughs> Dude, yo, that's insane. Yeah. So <laughs> that's got to be the best show ever. <laughs> I mean, for other people, like, I'm, I'm sure if you were there, you would have been like, oh, best show of all time. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> But my Michael Jackson joke would have killed there. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, if you know, it was it was real, real bad. That's the kind of room that you wish Bill Burr was around for. Oh, my God. I know. Yeah, man. Like where he's just ripping into everyone. That would be so great. They like, would, that's they would what I was hoping you were going to. If they would have given you time, I figured that's what you were saying you were going to do to them. Oh, yeah. But. 23 seconds is not a lot of time. 
I, you made the start. I don't know how you got so much done in 23 seconds. Well, here's the thing. Like, I, I don't know. You've, you've seen me one, once or twice where I have a little more time. I actually sound like a human being when I have more time, you know? <laughs> but whenever someone's like, you have five minutes, I'm like, all right. Like, I, I talk so fast <laughs> when, I'm, when I only have five minutes because, I ha- because my jokes are very wordy, you know? And so, but when I have time... I actually sound like a human being because every, you know, and, and people are like, wow, that guy's really energetic. He's on Adderall or something. And it's like, no, no it's, it's cocaine. Dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not Adderall. <laughs> you've done a lot of really cool shows, man. You've been opening for Brendan Schaub and you did Brian Callen as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like, how are, how are those shows? And they're fun. They're fun. They, they, it's funny because those two do a podcast together. So I expected their, you know, material, their style to be a little similar. Yeah. And they really weren't. They really weren't. Yeah. Man, Callan's shows are fun, but I do love Shab's shows. Yeah. Because he's a bro. Yeah. And so I'm walking. So I did the Tampa Improv with him, and the way the Tampa Improv works is it was a great club. It's a beautiful club. It's like a, a. a a converted vaudeville theater. Mm-hmm. So there's three levels, and the green room is in the third level, but there's no plumbing on the third level. So we have to go to the bathroom on the second floor. So we're walking through the crowd, going to the bathroom, and like, oh, that's your own private bathroom. It's like, then why is Dickhead over there using it? <laughs> like, that's not our private bathroom. Yeah. But just walking along, saying what's up to the crowd, they're all bros. And it's funny that you can just tell these guys are coming with such dime pieces. That's like, look, I swear, I, I know you don't like stand-up comedy, but just, you're going to like this guy. And then they're like, I just, and because there's a lot of Hispanics in, in, of in Tampa, I just, I don't know if I want to go see a stand-up comedian. And they show him a picture of Brandon. He's like, I can go see a stand-up show today. Exactly. And all these fucking Jack dudes, if they're not coming with other dudes, they're coming with beautiful people. Yeah. So that, that's a little fun. That's yeah, that is really funny because, like, I, I feel like Dalia attracts people like that, too, where it's like, but but kind of to Dalia's detriment because he doesn't like people like that. Yeah. He's very open about not liking bros and how bros are like, you're just like me. And it's like, I'm not, no, though. No, <laughs> I'm not, though. That's like when someone says, oh, my God, you look just like insert ugly celebrity here. Yeah. And or for, like, oh, us, you or, fucking or for us, it's like, wow, you look like uh, every fat guy from every movie ever. <laughs> I've gotten Kevin James. I've gotten Jonah Hill. Yeah. Uh, but it's funny because they don't know Kevin James's name. So yeah. they call me Paul Blart. Oh great! That's so that's dope. That's the worst. <laughs> no, I, I, but I like performing. I like performing for. I love diverse crowds and all. Of course, because it's just, it's fun. But if I had to give myself a niche like that, I had to perform for one group of people for the rest of my career. Fuck yeah, bros every time. Yeah, they're just funny to fuck with. And if they've got a good sense of humor, then when you're doing crowd work, it's fucking it's god given. When it's, you were doing blessed. when you were doing those shows, were you doing crowd work or were you doing your material? Well, I only have 10 minutes, uh, 10, or, 10 to 15, but I, I try to stay respectful. I do 10. Of course. When, I'm, you know, when you're hosting for other people, sometimes they'll give you 15. Like I, I, the show on Wednesday was a two-man show, so I did 30. Um, but when I'm working with Shaw, he has me do 10, 12 minutes. And so I, I love doing crowd work. So it's pretty much if the crowd work is working, I'll do crowd work in one long bit. Or if the crowd work's not working, I just I go into material. Yeah. But usually, I, I, the crowd work with his crowds are, it's easy, bro. They make it easy for us. Yeah. Is, <laughs> they're so funny to fuck around with. Yeah, that's the thing that you're so good at that um that I'm jealous of in in the best way that I think you're so good at crowd work. What are you talking about? I really do. I think you're so good at crowd work because you you do what my favorite thing about like good roasters do where you will make fun of someone, but it, there's no way that that person's going to get their feelings hurt because you, (laughs) because you know, you just can tell by the way that your inflection is that it's a joke. You know what I mean? Man, thanks. Like you're very, very good at it. Like there's some people that when they roast people, it's just like, Whoa, that was really hard. It's a little malicious. Exactly. And there's never 
any sense of maliciousness with you. Um, at least from what I've seen, I try. I, yeah, that's when when I'm joking with people, when I'm roasting with them, fucking around with them. I I, I remember I, I'm a kid that got bullied. Yeah. So I don't want to make anyone feel like they're getting bullied. I want them to feel like I'm their friend, fucking around with them. Exactly. And that's where my crowd work comes from. And yeah, sometimes I get rude. If you if you start heckling, I'll get rude. But yeah. if you're just having fun with the show and you're a little too drunk and you just want a little bit of attention, I'll give you a little bit of attention. I'll embarrass you a little bit, but. Like the way your your best friend does, and that's that's what I try to. So it's really dope that you you tell me that. Yeah. I appreciate that. I appreciate no, that a lot. I that's one of one of the best things about you for sure. I I think. I mean, granted, I've only seen a couple of shows where you're actually given a good amount of time because you are a storyteller comic. So I rarely ever get to see you actually do material. Yeah, man. <laughs> Majority of it is always crowd work, and I'm like, man, he's so good at crowd work because that's something that. I get so nervous to do crowd work because I'm scared that they're going to say, they're going to say something back to me. That's like, Oh, but you're not funny. And then everyone's like on their side. And then I'm like, okay, great. What you am know? I going to do from here? Yeah. What yeah. am I going to do? Some like it's only worked for me one time where I did crowd work and the room, the room already loved me, and then the room set itself on fire when I did crowd work. That's the thing with crowd work, though. It's it can it can turn a good performance into a great performance. Yeah, people, for some reason, especially here in Miami, I've noticed when yeah. you get into crowd work and you just start roasting these comics. It's like it, not excuse me, not comics, but you're roasting the crowd and having fun with them, and you're doing it well. Nothing makes them laugh louder. Yeah. Than good crowd work here in Miami. The thing that I noticed, because I started in L.A., and in L.A., what I learned was everyone wants, like, everyone likes your personal story. So everyone wants to know who you are. And here, stand-up is a conversation. And In what sense? In the sense of, like... Yeah, we want to know who you are, but if something's going on, we want you to address it. We want you to we want you to know like we want to know that you see us. Yeah. Like we want to know that you're real. Like that kind of thing. Miami people wanting attention on themselves? What are you talking <laughs> about, bro? Yeah, like there was so anyway, in this in this bar that I that I was at, I'm doing really well and this girl, like I said, you know, it, stand up here is is a lot like a conversation. I have this bit where there has never been a time where I have done this bit and it doesn't have people shouting out or a heckle or something. But it is this bit that I do about Disney princesses and about how you know who a guy likes in real life by what Disney princess he's attracted to. And I go through every single Disney princess and everyone has to speak their mind. And so I've gotten to a point where it's like, if everyone's going to speak their mind, I better have something to say, you know? And so this girl, you know, I'm, I'm talking and, and she's like basically having this conversation with me. <laughs> she's like, yeah, uh-huh, okay, uh-huh. <laughs> that's, so, that's really funny. Uh-huh. <laughs> Don't tell me that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like like she's like <laughs> she's like uh if if little john was a blonde girl that was drunk at a, at a bar and uh <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah okay uh-huh <laughs> and so and <laughs> finally so and finally i get i get to the point where it's the truth nugget of the joke is like you know we we don't understand what love is and and you know i use the the metaphor of bell and the beast to prove there to show people that love is actually about you know making someone better and that person making you better and then that's really what love is 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 being being two pieces to form one piece you know and usually it gets it gets the crowd on my side it gets the girls you know being I'm like like oh that's so cute you know whatever and then the punchline is like but that it just isn't real like no one does that you know <laughs> it's also stockholm syndrome too it's, exactly well yeah there's there's plenty of things like i can technically make fun of every princess and never have a good point about <laughs> <laughs> about any of them you know but but I use it to, like, kind of get to a good point. And anyway, she started heckling, or not heckling, but she was talking the whole time. And I was just like, 
And then at one point I was like, yeah. And, and one of my favorite things to do with these girls, because it's always a girl, it's never a guy, for, which is really strange. It's always a girl that is shouting out. And so my, my thing to do is to go, yeah, am I right, Tiffany, or whatever your name is? And then it gets a huge laugh because like it usually always sounds like it's a Tiffany. And she goes, <laughs> and she goes, actually, my name is Stephanie. And then, and then there's like a second and it's like, you, you know, those moments where it's as a comic, you go into bullet time from the matrix and you everything's in slow motion yeah. and you're just like, I'm about to hit them with the best joke. And you're like, I knew it was one of the sisters from full house. And then everyone just goes, <laughs> Oh my God. Like just starts like <laughs> everyone's going everywhere. And then I was like, yes, because not only is that joke great, it leads into my clothes. I was about to ask. But... <laughs> so like, so, cause like my, my closer is this thing about full house. And so I make, I made fun of it. And then, you know, it made, it made the closer better than usual because people are like, Oh wow, he's making fun of this thing. And, and they think that it's like associated with this girl. Bro. All right. So you know how, have you seen these new comics Andrew Schultz coined the term, I keep bringing him up, coined the term clapter. Dude, where I comics are just so trying much. to be woke. Yeah. And instead of saying punchlines, they should say shit like, women are better than men. And then, yeah. oh, everyone goes crazy. Like, man, I had a good set. It's like, no, you just said cliche things to mm-hmm. make the girls in here like you. Yeah. You know those people? All right. So one thing I, I love, it's very much like my my crowd that I my crowd work that I like to that I'm doing is I'm saying stuff that's woke. And coming out from behind and fucking knocking it down. That's the best thing to do. Very. And <laughs> so there, there's this new bit about uh, that, that I. So I have a tattoo of an 18 wheeler on my arm. Yeah. And I have a whole bit about it. I didn't get it for the bit. I got it because I thought it was actually dope. <laughs> and then I realized this I is a fucking bit, yeah. joke that yeah. I have an 18 wheeler on my arm and I don't drive trucks. <laughs> and but part of it is that part of the reason I got an 18 wheeler, the main reason is my daughter. Yeah. It's a Mac truck. I call my daughter Mac. And like I said, Mac Daddy. Yeah. And and because of the mac and cheese truck. Of course. That's that's the main reason. <laughs> that's really the reason. It says why. House of Mac on the side of my arm. <laughs> <laughs> and I go into the bit where it's like the re- the main reason I got it is for my daughter because I don't want her to be a dainty little flower like a lot of guys have on their on their bodies. I want her to be a Mac truck. I want that's her to knock everything so in her dope. way down. And it's it's the honest reason why I got it. That's it is the honest so reason. Dope. But I say that to the crowd, and they're, they start fucking clapping, clapping, clapping. And the girls love it, and the guys are next to the girls, so they have to pretend like they love it. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I come out and I say, but all you guys heard is that I want my daughter to be a lesbian. <laughs> That's so good. So, <laughs> That's so good. Can I go back to crowd work? Yeah, you please. Know, the way you describe my crowd work? Yeah. So... My sister got married, and the way, the way I roast, it's the way I roast, the way I make yeah. fun of people. It comes from a loving place. Of course. She found out that I was writing a speech for her wedding. I'm her brother. I should be allowed to speak at her wedding. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I said the speech to my parents, and it was very lift her up to knock her down, lift him up to knock him down. Yeah. And they heard it. They loved it. They're like, just say it for Christina. And... That way she can approve of it and she won't be si- hit from that field on the day of her wedding. Remember, it's her day. I'm like, you know what? It is her day. I have no problem running it by her. Yeah. She straight up heard one line from my set and said, yeah, you're not allowed to touch a microphone on my wedding day. Yeah, she banged the gong. Do you want to hear what it was? <laughs> what was it? All right. So it was, I'm so happy for my sister that she found someone that is perfect for her. She found someone that his strengths complement her needs. And her needs complement his strengths. Uh, like, we all know Anthony's a chef and Christina loves to eat. <laughs> That's it. That's the end of the joke. <laughs> very heartfelt. Very, f- And then it comes funny because, oh, Christy likes to eat. Uh, but it's, she heard that and said, you're not allowed to touch a microphone. I had a 10-minute speech of sh- shit like that. Bro, I'll I, be I'll be honest with you. Is your sister is she a millennial? She's way more millennial than me. She spent she spent 
two years in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. So she's as millennial as it gets. So I want to run this by you because I think it's true. I feel like the generation before us, they did this thing called fishing for compliments and millennials fish for negativity. <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, I know the fishing for compliments. That's when a girl's like, oh, I don't know about my hair today. And it's like, dude, your hair looks, you clearly got your hair done and it looks beautiful. What? No, what I'm saying about fishing for negativity is that they'll hear something like, well, he's a chef and she likes to eat. And then it's like, are you saying that I'm fat? Exactly. And it's like, no, I'm saying that you like to eat because we're humans and we like eating. We do like surviving, right? Yeah, and food is good. (laughs) Especially when it's coming from a chef. I know, she heard that, and yeah, that's exactly what she thought. She's like, he's not going to make fat jokes at my wedding. I'm like, I'm not making a fucking fat joke. You're not making fat jokes. (laughs) That's that's the thing. Like, yeah, so I feel like it's like, a lot of us are like fishing for negativity all the time, you know? Um, yeah, there's there's instances of a lot of things in my life where I'm just like, really? Like, that's what you got from it? Holy cow. But that's my favorite thing to do when I'm writing the material now. If, or not really writing material, but if I'm talking about people, if yeah. my material has to do with people, I love lifting up to slam down. <laughs> that's my favorite thing. <laughs> Women are super strong, but to be strong, they got to be... Like, obviously, I don't believe... That to be a strong woman, you have to be a lesbian. I married a super strong woman. Like I said, third degree black belt. Mm -hmm. I'm all down for strong women, but it makes for a funny fucking joke. Yeah, of course. But when I say it, I get a little in trouble. And it's like, you guys, you're missing the point, dude. Yeah. No, it's it's true, man. I mean, it's it's something where like I we talked about this because there was a bit that I was trying to do for a while. Speaking of bits that you believe in, but they just don't work. Uh, there's a bit that I thought of because of your your podcast, your old podcast, The Old Wooden Ship. The best fucking bit. I thought it was great. It, it was this bit about how... Um, <laughs> about how... it. Why isn't there positive racism? There is you know? such good racism out there. <laughs> yeah, like there's like positive, you know, where where it like sounds a little wrong, but then when you think about it, it's actually very true, you know? Like, for example, when you see a group of black people, there <laughs> being a guy that's like, oh, thank God, cool people. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> or, like, when you see an Asian, you're like, oh, thank God a doctor's here. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's like, is that racist, though? It's not, because he has a better job than me, and I'm assuming <laughs> that he's smarter than me. I'm like, assuming he's done better in his life than I have. Exactly. It's actually it's actually a positive thing, you know? That is such a... But a I lot of people that. just don't get it. Like, they're just like, I don't, you know? Well, a lot of people forget that when we're on stage, the shit we say is jokes. Yeah. It's like when... I, I think we spoke about this before, either on the podcast or somewhere else. Yeah. Where people get mad at actors in a movie or show. Yeah. How are you going to get mad at that actor? He didn't even write it. Mm-hmm. He just performed it. Yeah. That's like getting mad at Josh Brown. Like, I can't believe you killed half of humanity. Like, bitch, no, he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> You're still here. <laughs> it's so true, man. Yeah, that I I feel like we talked about that because that happened to Delia, right? Where he was on yeah. The Good Doctor and people were like, You're scum. I would never believe in you. Or I would never trust you. And it's like, trust me. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> It's crazy. What shows do you have coming up? Do you have anything to promote? No. Nothing? <laughs> no. Well, you have a new podcast. I've got my podcast. It's a podcast centered around sports in Miami called Getting Cultural. So you can listen to that. Let me tell you something, man. I'm sure you could tell, but I don't I don't even like sports. But I love your podcast. <laughs> I watch it I watch it all the time. I'm subscribed to it. I love it. It's hilarious. I think if you like sports you'll you'll love it but if you like comedy you'll love it too it's very stupid yeah it's it's more comedy than it is sports i try you know? to keep it like that i got that i got the power 96 morning show so if you're in the car and you're old and you don't listen to streaming services <laughs> and you decide to listen hey i'm gonna listen to terrestrial radio thanks for paying my check and you can you listen go. 96.5 other than that uh just the next time i get booked just waiting for that that's how it is you get booked very last minute when you're, when you're at this low level. Yeah. Where can people find you online? 
uh, at that Luis Diaz guy on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook.com slash Luis Diaz comedy. Uh, but pretty much Instagram at, at that Luis Diaz guy. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, my name is Mike Valdez. You can find me on Instagram at Mike Valdez. Twitter, I am Mike Valdez. And you can go to whoismikevaldez.com to find out the answer to that question. Thank you so much for listening. And subscribe, tell all your friends, all that stuff. And uh, come back next week when I speak to a different person. Bye, besties. <laughs>